Welcome to our lecture on types of structural action. This is from chapter one, section six. Um, there are four basic types of structural action. One is axial tension, where members are stretched out along their length, the direction of their uh, longest dimension. There is pure compression, where members are being compressed or crushed or shortened along their long length. There's bending, where forces are perpendicular to the longest dimension of the member. And finally, there's torsion, where there's a twisting action. And then, of course, there's every possible combination of these types of structural action. In this diagram, we see a member, which is a 1 8 inch diameter piece of PVC plastic. In this case, it's dark gray. Um, so this piece is maybe 4 or 5 inches long and an eighth of an inch in diameter. It's been glued into a block of wood here and a block of wood at the top. Uh, the block of wood at the top has been screwed to the wall and then some eyelets have been provided in this bottom chunk and then cord is used to hang weights off. So we're stretching or elongating this piece of uh, PVC rod. In this case, there are about 20 pounds on it. Um, could have held much more than that, but uh, I did this little demonstration on the wall outside my office and I didn't want the weights to come down and smash the floor. So I didn't take this to failure, but uh, it illustrates the point, this 20 pounds is about uh, uh, nine kilograms roughly uh, and so you can keep that in mind that nine kilograms didn't even come close to um, failing this member. In compression here we have a device with a hinge across here connecting this piece to that piece so this piece is able to rotate around that axis point so we take that same piece of PVC rod uh, and, and put it in between here. So it started off straight and we added weights and brought it to the point where it abruptly buckled. So it was straight under load and more load and then at some point it just snapped to the side like this. And these weights would have collapsed downward and crushed this thing and the weights would have flown all over the place except that we have this block of wood that was inserted to just stop the action once that failure mode had begun. So this is abrupt. It's not self-limiting. This buckling failure is a snapping to the side and a loss of all structural integrity. But we're able to sort of freeze it in this case because we've got this block of wood that has stopped the action and we're able to see the shape of it during the, during the process of buckling failure. This shape is half of a sine curve and the rest of the sine curve would do something like the following. Um, it would come down and be shaped something like this and then up there. But we don't see all of that, we just see half of the sine curve. The third common kind of structural action, so in this case we have stretching along the axial direction. Here we have a compressive force along the axial direction which has caused this buckling failure. And the reason that the load is much smaller here than there is because in the case of compression, uh, in addition to crushing of the material or yielding of the material, you also have this potential failure we call buckling where it begins to abruptly change shape long before it reaches the yield stress. And in fact, in this case, if we lift this weight off, this column will straighten itself out again and it will perform equally well the second time through because we have never approached the yield stress of the material and the failure mode is simply that the material starts to abruptly change shape. All right, so we went from nine kilograms down to 0.8 kilograms. This is 500 grams, 200 and 100. So we have 800 grams or 0.8 kilograms. So we're holding more than 10 times as much load here in this tensile mode as we did in the compressive mode because the tensile mode only fails through material yielding. 
whereas in the case of compression there is the potential for this buckling phenomenon or what we call elastic instability. In other words, we're not at the yield strength the stress level of the material is still in elastic mode, but it begins to change shape abruptly. We can make this column work much better if we braced it at the mid-height, then we'd have an S-shaped curve like that for the failure mode, and if we braced it at more points, it would get stronger and stronger, and this PVC rod would work just as well in compression as it does in tension, but it would need to be really well braced in order to make that happen. <clears throat> Okay, so here we have bending illustrated. The long axis of the member is going this way. We're exerting a vertical force downward, which we're doing so by hanging this weight. Um, and in this case, this turns out to be 200 grams, and that's 200 grams. So we're at 400 grams, and we have this huge deflection. And basically, in, buck in bending, uh, this member is not working very well. Efficiency-wise, generally things work absolutely better Intention, assuming the material is good intention, materials like concrete that are very weak intention, this argument doesn't hold, but for steel, aluminum, wood, and so forth, uh, the performance intention tends to be better than the performance in compression because compression has this buckling mode, and this tends to be better than that in the end. So here we have 400 kilograms, here we have 800, and just with a slight bit more weight here, basically this beam just bent so much and deformed so much that the weight would fall through. So efficiency wise, tension generally is best, compression is next, and bending is the weakest mode. We do a lot of things though where we use bending stress because um, it turns out to be easy. For example, decking that encloses the building basically um, is always working in bending, um, but we don't really care because the spans tend to be really short, and even though it's inefficient, that's a very economical way to get the building enclosed. Okay, the fourth mode is torsion, um, and in this case you'll notice here on the bottom we have an I section. In the middle we've got a bunch of slabs of this styrene plastic glued together into a solid bar, and then up here we have a tube, a square tube. For each of these members, this I-beam, that tube, and this slab in between, we've used the same material and the same amount of material in the cross-section. We've just configured it differently. And you'll notice we have these weights that are out at the end of a lever. So this is like, think of this as being like a wrench that you're using to torque a nut onto a threaded rod or a bolt um, and the magnitude of the the weight is an indicator of the torque because in each case the lever arm which is from the center of the force to the center of the member is the same in each of these cases. You'll notice the overwhelming greatest force is the one we've applied to the tube. The tube shows, shows no evidence of torsional deformation. Um, we have a much lighter load on the slab, and yet the slab is showing very visible deformation. And then we have the lightest load of all on the I section, and the I section is showing the greatest deformation. So I sections, or wide flange sections, which work really well in bending, are really bad in torsion. So if we have any kind of eccentric load that's tending to twist the member, the last member that we ever want to use is a wide flange. Okay, so let's see some examples of tension elements. Uh, here we have a building, which uh, is, tends to be quite unstable in this direction. So for forces in that direction, or forces in this direction, it tends to flop over. These rigid frames will flop over. So the structure has been stabilized with these cross braces. Um, so for this wind force in this direction, this member goes into tension, this member tends to go slack. For wind forces in that direction, this member tends to go into tension, and that member tends to go slack. Here's another example of cross bracing. This is the huge overhangs on the California Academy of Sciences and Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. It's a really beautiful building 
that has won awards for a variety of reasons having to do with its design features. In this case, we have these really tall, slender columns which tend to be uh, very unstable under forces that way or forces that way. There's not a whole lot of wind force on this canopy, but there's a huge seismic potential. Uh, and this has to be restrained because all of this is glass with embedded photovoltaics. So you can't have this overhang whipping back and forth. It will crush the glass and cause it to fall over. So you'll notice we have cross bracing here and there and also uh, here and here and here and here and so under wind force in that direction this element goes into tension that element goes into tension and that one goes into tension and the other the alternate members tend to go slack uh, here's another example at the california academy of sciences this is the glass dome inside that contains this tropical environment uh, there's very little wind load on it because it's inside the building, but there's a lot of weight in the glass, and this is a seismic environment, so the cross bracing here uh, becomes crucial to the stabilization to keep the glass from breaking and falling out. Here are some more examples of tension members. In, in the case of cross bracing, of course, we, we tend to have them working in a neutral state most of the time until some kind of force comes along that they're intended to resist. They're usually designed for lateral forces, and that means when there's no wind or seismic effect, they're in a fairly neutral state. This is an example of active tensile elements. So these vertical elements are suspenders, which are carrying the weight of this road bed and these stiffening trusses and so forth. In this case, there's a road bed on top and bottom, and all that load is being carried by these vertical suspenders, which are in a state of pure tension under gravity load. These elements then support the suspenders. These are the suspension elements that span from tower to tower. Uh, they have uh, forces along their length and at the top here, the force has to be in this direction, which means there is both a vertical and a horizontal component. That horizontal component is absolutely crucial. We get it by anchoring this entire system into this mountain at the end of the structure. Oh, here's another example of a tensile roof. It doesn't look like it because it's fairly thick and it's made out of concrete. But if you see the original construction, you'll see these steel cables, which are unbelievably delicate. And then there are concrete slabs put on top of it, and those slabs are quite massive. So that's what keeps the roof from blowing away. Because if all you had was the cables, there would be a powerful tendency for the roof to fly away, even in a fairly minor wind. Here's another building. This is a tensile element which is supporting the structure. Uh, the tensile element needs a horizontal component which is being supplied. I don't know whether this is that visible or not, but uh, let's go see if we can pick a different color here. Um, there are horizontal forces being provided by this truss which is holding that tension element outward and allowing it to work. So this is what that structure looks like during construction. And to keep it from flying around, there are these temporary frames that have been put in, but they will disappear as soon as the structure is fully in place. So let's talk about some compression elements. We'll just jump back to this. First of all, uh, these columns have to hold up the ends of these truss elements which means the, tr the, excuse me, this tension element, which means the tension element is actually exerting a downward force on these verticals. So these verticals at each end of the building are the compression structures that carry the forces to the foundations. Um, within that building, this is the uh, cable structure, or at least, excuse me, the tensile structure. These are steel cables and part of the tensile structure is being carried in this I section and we'll talk about why there is sort of these duplicate functions uh, when we get into more sophisticated details of uh, this particular structure. Um, but these elements right here are working as columns 
and they are carrying the loads from the upper floor. So you see these trusses come in and they land on these vertical elements and those vertical elements bring the loads down to this tensile element uh, or the suspension element. These elements though on the other hand act more like the suspenders in the the bay bridge that I showed in the previous image. They are basically supporting roof trusses down below so we render these elements right here as wide flange columns so they're they have breadth to resist buckling but on the other hand when we go look at these elements and we look at them edge on here we discover that those are rendered as one inch by eight inch plates in other words because they're not vulnerable to buckling they don't need a lot of breadth and to sort of visually uh, express that and give the absolute widest window opening uh, these are plates rather than wide flange uh, cross-sectional elements such as these we see above so this shows that structure with a suspension element and you'll notice in this case uh, to sort of emphasize the difference between the tensile and compression elements on the vertical here where there the tensile elements are hanging off of the suspender the glass has been brought forward, the mullions have been absolutely minimized to suggest a sort of delicate quality. Up above, the glass has been recessed backwards and the columns have been encased in material to make them thick and more massive looking to express their column-like nature or compression function. And when you look off from the side, it's extremely dramatic. All this material up here, you see those black mullion elements which are encasing those columns and then down below here you see uh, glass that comes right out to the surface sort of expressing the tensile and thin nature of it. Okay so here's a structure this is a compression element these members are working in compression pushing down these elements are in tension there's been less emphasis in this structure on expressing the sort of tensile quality of what's down below, but these could have been rendered as thin plates, uh, not unlike the previous building we looked at. Under wind load in this direction, this element goes into tension. Under wind load in that direction, this element goes into tension. And some of the stability of this building has to do with moment connections between the verticals and the horizontals. Uh, but most of the lateral stability is handled by these diagonal elements. And this building, by the way, has a tension element down at the bottom, which is required to keep this compression element from thrusting outward. In other words, the compression element needs a force here, and that force is being provided by the tension element down at the bottom. Here's a combination of tension and compression. So we have cables on the outside. We have this compression member in the middle. It's rendered as much thicker. So this is what it looks like. These tension elements are cables under wind load against the wall here. This element tends to go slack and So, in other words, under wind load against this glass, this element goes slack, that element goes into, com into tension, and this element works in compression. So you'll notice it's rendered as a big, fat, round tube, whereas these are very thin cables, working in tension. So here we have uh, tension in this member and compression in that member. Okay, so let's talk about some examples of bending elements. In this case, we've got a piece of foam rubber. When it just sits in a neutral state on the tabletop, it's completely flat. When we put it up on top of these supports, uh, it bends under its own weight. So in essence, we've got a bunch of forces here, or a distributed gravity force, all along this element, which is inducing this bending deformation and the nature of the deformation is that elements that were parallel are now splayed relative to each other which suggests that they're stretching along the bottom there's compression across the top so the top part's getting shorter the bottom part's getting longer 
If we drew the stress distribution, it would look something like this, where you'll notice we have compression at the top and tension at the bottom, and then it's neutral at the midpoint of the beam. Um, this, these forced distributions, compression in the top and tension in the bottom, create what we call the internal resisting moment, which is what keeps the beam functioning and stable. All right, so we can have beams that are like rectangular in cross-section, and this is a classic example of what we call a solid sawn beam. That's a rectangular cross-section. And in fact, the decking that sits on top of it has a rectangular cross-section because that just makes sense in terms of what we want that floor to do and because it's really easy to saw a rectangular board out of a log. Um, so, the stress distribution is the following. We're getting moment by having lots of force near the top and bottom, but not much going on near the center of the beam. So if we can afford to do it, we would like to actually redistribute the materials so we have less cross-section in this zone and more cross-section at top and bottom because that's where we have more stress and we have more lever arm. So that leads us to change the shape from a simple rectangular cross-section to more of an I-shaped uh, section like we're showing here. So in steel, which works really well in shear, we can afford to have very thin webs, put most of the material in what we call the flanges at top and bottom. So here's a wide flange uh, beam right here. This is a stub of a beam that's coming out to support uh, a piece of a column and some brickwork and things of that sort. Um, but this is the common shape for beams is this uh, used to be called an I section, but we wanted wider and wider flanges for lateral stability. And eventually we quit using the terminology I section. And in, in the case of steel, we call them wide flanges. All right, so coming back here, by the way, you don't just have wide flange sections for, for beams in floors, but you can have beam-like action in another element like this huge vertical that we said was handling gravity load and compression, but under wind load against the face of this building, this entire element, this vertical element at the end is like a beam which is cantilevering out of the ground and its cross section has been rendered like an I section. Um, so it's, and what's really cool about this is that the thick flange element right here happens to be aligned right underneath this heavy cable. So there's this beautiful synergism where most of the bulk of the material has been put supporting those elements um, the, the tension elements that are doing the spanning and then they've been connected together let's see if I can make this work by this web which then gives them bending action relative to forces in that direction. In the case of wood even we can do this normally we're not motivated to reshape a solid sawn cross-section because the weak shear material uh, and and the tendency to not stand compression too well make us have no motive to redesign a solid sawn beam. But if we have materials that can work pretty well, like uh, oriented strand board and plywood work pretty well in shear, so we can make web members out of that, like so. And then we can create flanges by gluing this micro lamb material. So these are the flanges and we actually get eye sections even in wood, which we call uh, eye joists. Okay, so typically when we load a beam, we discover that the most likely place for it to fail is at the center. And so one of the things we might want to do is adjust the depth of the beam. So here's an example. This is a glass beam, which is thickest at the middle and tapers to a thinner dimension at top and bottom. The extra depth is put at the center 
to deal with the fact that the stresses are going to be higher at the center. Here's another example. This is the Phoenix Airport where the depth of this welded up plate beam is deepest near the middle and tends to be much uh, shallower near the ends. Uh, sometimes in, in this case we have a simple span beam where the failure mode tends to occur here. Um, if we have a support at the center that doesn't change too much in the sense that the worst um, internal moment is tending to occur at the center and there's very little going on out here. So we actually taper this beam so it's thicker at the middle than it is near the end. Sometimes we also do things like changing the flange dimension. So here's a long built up welded up plate girder and at some point near the ends the width of the flange is not very wide but they make it wider uh, near the middle where the where the bending action or the so-called moment is the worst. Here's another thing we can do. We can start with an eye section and in this case we're going to cast a nice thick piece of concrete and if we can get the concrete working with it with the eye beam we effectively make the structure deeper and the way we do that is with these uh, shear pins um, or what's called a shear stud which gets welded to the top of the beam and then when the concrete is poured and cured um, these shear studs assure that if this flange goes into compression it puts compression also into the slab so the slab becomes a part of the beam. Um, this is just what that looks like after the steel deck has been put down. Years ago we used to weld these studs on at the factory and send the beam out like this. Nowadays there's portable welding equipment and these studs are actually welded in place after the decking is put down. But underneath here there's a wide flange beam and these studs are intended to make the connection between that beam and the concrete that's going to get poured on top of this decking. Okay, let's talk about torsion. And I don't have any absolutely pure torsional examples. Usually in architecture we have torsion mixed with bending. So here is an example. Here we have this curved bridge which spans from column support to column support. So it's working in bending. It has gravitational forces that are perpendicular to its long length. Because it's curved, it also has a tendency to fall over or torque over, and that's why it's been rendered as this round tube, because the round tube works pretty well as a bending member, and it also works extremely well as a torsional member, and it also looks kind of cool, and I'm sorry I don't have a close-up right now, but you'll notice these little beams that are coming off have this classic quality that, first of all, they're rounded, they're coped on the top so that they they engage this round tube really well, but they're also deeper at the launch point than they are out at the tip. So they're similar to the cantilever beam we showed earlier. Uh, here's another example. We have a curved beam. It's tending to torque over in that direction because of its offset of its uh, gravitational center. And it also has a tubular cross section. In this case, they've pulled the tube back. They could have come all the way out here and created a really big tube. Um, the, the two reasons to do that is that pulling it back creates this nice thin edge, which makes the whole thing seem much more delicate. Um, but also, this roadbed up here is better supported at these points than it would be if it was supported out at the ends because then this decking spanning across here doesn't have to span as far. And you'll notice we even see cantilevering effects where the decking is thicker right here than it is out at the tip. So it's a really beautiful expression of all the different kinds of things we've been talking about. Okay, so that ends our discussion of types of structural action from Chapter 1, Section 6. We've talked about tension, compression, bending, torsion, and some combinations of the above.